The Lord be with you. And also with you. Thank you. It is so good to be joining together with you this morning in worship in, in God's house today. Uh, we pray God's blessings on your worship with us this morning, and especially if you are a guest or a visitor, we want to extend a warm welcome to you, and, and we pray uh, God richly blesses your time with us here this morning. Just a couple of housekeeping items. If you're unfamiliar with our layout today, our restrooms are located off the hallway to your left, and you can push those doors open with your elbow and uh, lever them open with your foot on the way out for contactless entry and exit. And we have hand sanitizer stations located in both hallways uh, and in the narthex in the back as well. If you haven't already found them, we'd encourage you uh, to uh, grab the red registration booklets in your pews next to you there and to put in uh, your name and, and contact information, especially if you haven't done that for a while. Sometimes our records are out of date and that's a way for us to make sure we can uh, stay in touch with you and that everything is current. Uh, and it's also a way of uh, you being able to indicate your presence here in God's house today. We will be celebrating the Lord's Supper this morning as well as we do each week here at Light of the Hills. And in scripture we are told that when we receive uh, the bread and the wine, that we're not just receiving the bread and the wine, but that we're also receiving Christ's true body and true blood. And so uh, these are not just representations or, or symbols or remembrances, uh, but Christ is really here and is really present in this gift. And we're told to examine ourselves, to uh, discern the body of Christ, to be aware of our sinfulness and our, our need for forgiveness, uh, and to uh, make sure that we are in alignment with all of those things. And so if that is something that is unfamiliar to you or you're unsure about that, uh, we'd encourage you to talk with myself or Pastor Allen or one of our elders about that, and we'd be happy to discuss that with you further after the service so that you can receive this good gift. We would still welcome you coming up, though, if you would like to receive a blessing and would ask that you just cross your arms over your chest uh, to indicate that you would like that, and we'd be happy to do so at that time. Today we are continuing in our second week of our new Sunday sermon series, Secret Code. And as Pastor Allen talked about last week, Right? It's not that God is trying to keep things hidden or secret from us. Uh, it's not that he doesn't want us to know his will and, and his ways. But there are a lot of forces at work in the world that are trying to obscure God's truths from us. Right? Satan is operating out there in the world. We've got a lot of forces out there. Our own sinful nature tries to kind of obscure these truths of God from us. And so we're taking some time to look at some of these kind of counterintuitive or, or secret hidden ways of, of God in Scripture. And today we're going to be looking at a central teaching of Christianity, God's secret code of salvation. And we'll be doing that by looking at Romans 10. And so I encourage you to uh, ponder that as we go through the service in uh, word and song. And with that, I invite you to rise for our opening hymn. Thou hope of foundation
in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise and receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us. Forgive us our sins and lead us to our lasting life. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in sheer mercy you have promised that all who confess Jesus is Lord and call on your name will be saved. Give us unwavering confidence in your promise that we will not be abandoned or put to shame for relying on you to save us. And cause us daily to find refuge and refreshment in your forgiveness. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Twenty six. When you have entered the land the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, and have taken possession of it and have and settled in it, take some of the first fruits of all that you produce from the soil of the land the Lord your God is giving you and put them in a basket. Then go to the place the Lord your God will choose as a dwelling for his name and say to the priest in office at that time, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come to the land the Lord your sw swore to our forefathers to give us. 
The priest shall take the basket from your hands and set it down in front of the altar of the Lord your God. Then you shall declare before the Lord your God, My father was a wandering Aramean, and he went down into Egypt with a few people and lived there and became a great nation, powerful and numerous. But the Egyptians mistreated us and made us suffer, putting us to hard labor. Then we cried out to the Lord, the God of our fathers, and the Lord heard, heard our voice and saw our misery, toil, and oppression. So the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, with great terror and with miraculous signs and wonders. He brought us to this place and gave us this land, a land flowing with milk and honey. And now I bring the first fruits of the soil that you, O Lord, have given me. Place the basket before the Lord your God and bow down before him. And you and the Levites and the aliens among you shall rejoice in all the good things the Lord your God has given to you and to your household. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
This morning's New Testament letter comes from Romans chapter 10. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is, the word of faith we are proclaiming. That, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This too is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Luke, the 23rd chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation went down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in one Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Spray. 
Grace, mercy, peace, and salvation are yours in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Amen. So today we are continuing with our new Sunday sermon series. We're in our second week of Secret Code. And this morning we're going to be looking a little bit more at God's secret code, His plan for salvation. Now Pastor Allen and I chose this metaphor of secret code or of being sacred agents if you will, because we think that that metaphor actually communicates quite a bit about uh, the ways that God works in the world and about our identity as Christians and how to understand Scripture. Because when you think about intelligence agents and spycraft and covert and clandestine activities and all those things, it goes without saying, right, that there are always opposing sides, aren't there? And one of the ways that those two sides work against each other is not just in, in all those action sequences that we see in movies, but a lot of times is in the gathering and the sharing of intelligence, isn't it, or intel. And sometimes the way that these two sides work against each other is by sharing false intelligence with each other, false intel. They feed the other side's agents bad information. They try to trick them, to get them to do the wrong thing. They want to expose vulnerabilities. They conduct a disinformation campaign. We've actually been seeing quite a bit of that uh, around the world in the last few weeks in the news, haven't we? If you've been paying attention to the events in, in Russia and Ukraine. There's all sorts of disinformation out there. And just as an example, uh, before Russia invaded Ukraine, Apparently, they had planned to release a, a faked video of some of their own soldiers in Ukrainian uniforms attacking the Russians to try to make it look like Ukraine was the aggressors and that Russia was only acting in self-defense. Now, interestingly, I don't know if you caught this in the news, but apparently the United States had some intelligence. We had some agents or people placed in various places that knew this in advance. And so our intelligence agencies actually took that information and made it public to the world so that Russia couldn't use that strategy. And by all accounts, it actually delayed the invasion for a while. But they did that to, uh, to get the truth out, right? To get the good intelligence out there. Brothers and sisters, as I was 
thinking about all of that uh, this last week, it, it helped me to realize that, or it was a reminder of the fact that we too are at war, a spiritual war. Not every source of information out there is trustworthy and true. And not everything that we have heard about our salvation and our Christian life and about God and about Scripture from out there in the world necessarily comes from God. Satan and his agents and our sinful nature are working overtime to spread false intelligence about spiritual matters. They're conducting a, a perpetual disinformation campaign so that all of humanity can be led not to salvation, but to damnation. And so as sacred agents on mission in the world, it's important that you and I know the truth about God's secret code of salvation so that we can combat the enemy's lies. And contrary to the, the false information that the world feeds us, the false intel the world gives us, we do need salvation. We need saving because death is something that none of us can avoid. I heard a, a story a while back of a, a nurse who was a first-time mother, and so she went to uh, some uh, childbirth preparation classes, and apparently the instructor was a little bit overzealous in describing all of the dangers that occur after childbirth. And uh, she, she went so far, this instructor, as to say that the first five minutes of a person's life are the most dangerous five minutes of a person's life. To which the pregnant nurse, she was kind of a smart aleck, responded, yeah, well the last five minutes are pretty dangerous too. <laughs> And that nurse was so right. She was so right. And sometimes our, our culture forgets that, don't we? Our culture tries to ignore it or, or put it off. Our culture desensitizes us to it. it. It tells us we don't have to worry about it until we're older or, or down the road. But it doesn't change the truth. That the wages of sin is death as Paul says in Romans 6.23. And all of us have earned those wages. And so we have to ask, despite the false intel the world is putting out there, how are we saved? Well, there are a lot of texts that we could look at in Scripture to answer this question. It's a thread that runs all throughout the Bible. But we're going to hear from Romans 10, the text that the New Testament letter that was read earlier. Because in it, Paul is specifically writing to combat some uh, false disinformation, to uh, combat some false intel. So let's go ahead and begin by reading just this, this little bit of verse 8 together. The word is near you. Now, I was reading this and I didn't get very far in our text before uh, I had a question about this phrase here. And my question was, how can a word be near, right? A word is just something that is spoken to us. And so I thought, okay, well, we've got we've to decode this piece of intel that Paul is giving us here. And one of the best ways to decode Scripture is always to look at the broader context that a verse is in, if you have a question about it. And when we do that, when we look... Uh, just at the, the chapter around this text here, we see that Paul is lamenting, actually, that many of his fellow Jews don't know where to find salvation. He says they're looking high and they're looking low, that they're always striving and seeking and straining and searching, but that they never arrive. They never arrive at salvation. Paul says uh, in Romans 10.3, that they are ignorant of the righteousness of God. And they sought to establish their own righteousness, and because of that, they did not submit to God's righteousness. In other words, Paul is saying they believed the false intelligence out there. They got caught up in those lies. They thought that they were basically good people, that 
they were good people deep down and that if they worked hard, they could establish their own righteousness and they could secure salvation through their own efforts. They just had to push a little harder, go a little farther, muster a little more willpower. But because no human being is sinless, no human being can receive a word of approval from God for their own righteousness. His standard is perfection. Jesus says, be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. And that's none of us. Righteous perfection is always just a little farther down the road. It's just around the bend and out of sight. And you know, this, this isn't just a, a problem, or it wasn't just a problem back in Paul's day. It's a problem in our world here today, too. A lot of American churchgoers believe that they can establish their own righteousness. I just saw another survey this last week of American churchgoers, and they were presented with uh, the question, do you believe that you can be saved by your good works? Right? The central question to the Christian faith. And you know what? 52% of American churchgoers that call themselves Christians said, yes, I can be saved by my own good works. 52% are trying to establish their own righteousness apart from the righteousness that God gives in Christ, in other words. They're trying to do Christianity without Christ, which kind of begs the question, are they really Christians? if this is the central teaching of the Christian faith. And I'm not, I'm not trying to be harsh with these people, right? Because all of us at one point were lost before God came to us in mercy and brought us to faith in Him. But I, I point this out because these people are in grave spiritual danger. And here, Pastor Allen and I care about you, and so we don't want you to fall into that. We don't want you to believe that false intelligence, because that is not what Scripture teaches. And it's not what Jesus teaches. Jesus says, no one is good except for God alone. And Scripture teaches us in Galatians 2.16 that by the works of the law, no one will be justified. No one. It's not possible. And it's not even that God starts the salvation process and then he hands it off to us and we finish it. We're told in Galatians 3.3 that we cannot finish what the Spirit of God has started. And so if you and I try to insert ourselves into the salvation equation, if you will, we are always going to come up short, like trying to long jump the Grand Canyon. You might be the the best long jumper in the world and you're still going to be nowhere close we're always going to end up either overestimating our own righteousness or despairing on giving up and and being saved. And actually, I went through this myself earlier in my life. Uh, My family didn't grow up going to church uh, in my early years, and I was actually told by uh, some Christians, not here, but a different place in the community, I was told that I had to be saved by my good works. And so for the next 10 years or so, I I labored under that, wondering if I would ever be good enough for God to love me, for God to save me, and believing, knowing that I wasn't, right? That's false intelligence out there, and it's right here in our community. And so we need to be clear on that. But getting back to our text... Paul says in response to all this false intelligence, stop, just stop. You can't earn salvation. You can't meditate enough or do enough or be good enough. That's bad intelligence. Salvation isn't something that is far off that you have to go out and find. The word is near you. And let's go ahead and and read this together. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. And Paul is about to tell us in the next verse the content of that faith that we proclaim. Let's read this. 
If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's it. If you believe that, if you confess Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, Paul says. It's no more complicated than that. Folks, you just, you read that with me. Do you believe those things? Do you confess that? Do you believe that Jesus is Lord? Do you? Yeah, yeah. Do you confess that Jesus was raised from the dead for your salvation, your forgiveness, and your justification? Yes. yes. Then you are saved. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. That is it. That is the word of faith that God has brought near to you through his church, passed down through the ages. It's not something you had to go out and find. God came and found you. God came and found you and brought you to faith. And you see, that is how God works. He, he turns this whole equation upside down. He turns our, our natural, or not our natural, our sinful way of thinking upside down. He comes to us, and instead of us having to work our way and climb the ladder up to God, He comes to us before we ever even looked for Him in grace and mercy and in forgiveness. It's a, a wonderful, incredible gift that God gives us. And we, we need to hold on to that gift. We need to keep it central to our identities in this world because the truth is we're out there as sacred agents kind of all out on our own. And it can be easy, just like I imagine it would be easy for a, a secret agent to kind of start to forget your own identity after a while, right? You have to remind yourself of that identity and, and of these truths here. And so uh, we're going we're gonna to dwell on this statement a little bit and unpack this this morning so that you can take this out with you. Now, this title, uh, Jesus is Lord, I, I want to pause there and look at that a little bit this morning uh, and decode that further. Because Lord, you see, is uh, the New Testament's way of talking about God, of talking about the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, Yahweh. And so when we're saying that Jesus is Lord, we are also saying, right, that Jesus is God, that we believe that, just as we confessed in the creed a couple of moments ago, didn't we? God of God, light of light. And so what Paul is saying here about Jesus is that he is the creator of the universe. He is the, the sovereign king. And that this king, this creator, this God, came and entered into human flesh. That he lived a, a sinless life for us, as, as we confess in, the, in our uh, creedal statements, that he was punished for your sins on the cross once and for all, no more, no more payment necessary, and that God the Father raised him from the dead to gift you Christ's righteousness and to win you eternal life and forgiveness. Jesus marched straight into your sentence of damnation. He marched straight into hell for you there on the cross. And he let himself be killed by all of the things that we need saving from. He let himself be killed by sin and death and the devil so that he could save you. Because our God cares for you that much. That is the, the Lord that we have, the God that we have, who enters into creation for us, and now he lives and reigns to eternity to secure your forgiveness and your salvation forevermore. Let's go ahead and, and continue on with verse 11. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. And what Paul is saying here is that if you believe these things, like we just talked about, you confess these things, you're already justified. You're already saved. And so you can rest in those promises. You don't have to worry about those things. Uh, and 
as he, uh, he continues on here, he says, as Scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. Our God will not deny you. Our God will not put you to shame before him. You're not going to get up in front of him on judgment day, calling on the name of the Lord and be turned away from him. He's not going to forget you. Your hope in Jesus will not be in vain at the final judgment. You will be saved. And in fact, you, you are already. It's as good as done. Right? The New Testament authors kind of alternate between saying, you will be saved and you are saved now. The, na- the, the now and the not yet. Right? Because we already are saved. We're sealed for salvation. Paul says, by the Holy Spirit. But we're just waiting for all of these things to finally be manifested, for all of that to be revealed when God comes to recreate the heavens and the earth. But the battle, uh, there are still battles ongoing, but the war is already won. And so you can rest in that security, that salvation that God gives you. You can rest easy knowing that you are justified in Jesus Christ, that you are robed with his perfect righteousness, and that on the last day you will enter into the new earth to live in eternal blessedness and innocence and righteousness and purity before God forever. No more disinformation, no more wars or bombed out buildings or talk of nukes, no more aching hips and and backs and, and knees, no more skin cancer, no more strokes, No more Parkinson's, no more failures, no more shame, no more secrets ever again. No more cemeteries, no more funeral black, no more mourning or crying ever again. God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. Brothers and sisters, that is the promised hope that we have in Jesus Christ. The decoded hope that is here that we confess each and every week in the creed and in our songs and in our, our worship here as Christians. Our hope and our joy and our peace and our security is in knowing that for everything that God demands, he also supplies it freely in Jesus Christ. God supplies faith to those who believe his promises. He supplies forgiveness and righteousness, uh, the the forgiveness and righteousness demanded by our sins. And where uh, the life of his, he supplies the life of his son, where death demanded our lives. This is the miracle and the scandal of the gospel, that God does the work for us. And it's why Christianity is so different from every other religion out there. If you look at every other religion in the world, every other one is trying to get us to do something to earn our salvation, whether it's knowing enough or doing enough or meditating enough or or whatever it is. Christianity is the only one where God does the work. And that's not to say that we don't do good works or that we don't stop sinful behaviors that harm ourselves or harm others. But these are all always responses to the work that God has already done in gratitude. Right? You don't say thank you before someone has given you a gift. Right? And that's, that's what these works are. We're really saying thank you. We're living in gratitude and in the joy and the freedom of the gospel. And so this work of God, this gift of salvation, it is for you. And it is for all people. Let's go ahead and read these next verses. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord of all, Lord all, and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is you, and that is every believer in Christ, and that offer is on the table for everyone who is outside of these doors. You're sacred agents. Part of your job is to take this decoded message out there and to share that with them. For there is no distinction. Jew and Gentile, right? The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who calls on him. And God knows that we don't deserve this gift of salvation. 
We wouldn't need saving if we did, right? But the Son of God loves you anyway. And he gave himself up for you, and he invites you to call on his name for forgiveness and salvation. And so as you go out from here, I want you to remember that. Because with all of the the spiritual disinformation out there, and with all of the, the accusations of our own conscience and of Satan, it's easy to start believing that disinformation. It's easy for us to start doubting what's real and to start doubting if God's promises are true. It's easy for us to fall back into that thinking that our sins and our shortcomings disqualify us from forgiveness and for us to start trying to establish our own righteousness again. And so just like every secret agent needs to remember their true identity and that they're cared for and that their allies are working for them behind the scenes, even if they can't see them, you too need to remember as sacred agents your identity and that God loves and cares for you and that he is working in and for and through you in your life, even if you can't always see it. And that's why we come back here each and every week to hear those truths. It's why we read our our Bibles and do our family devotions on a regular basis to be reminded that salvation is near, that it is in our hearts and on our, our tongues, our lips, that salvation and forgiveness are already ours. We come back here each week because we depend on the intel that God gives us to keep from losing ourselves. We come back because God invites us to call on his name, as Martin Luther says, in every time of trouble, to pray and to praise and to give thanks to God. We call on the name of God placed on us at our baptisms in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Whenever we need forgiveness, whenever we need guidance, whenever we need strength, whenever we need hope, whenever we need comfort or peace, every day we call on the name of the Lord until our last day. And that's true if you're young and you're, you're looking ahead through your life, right? You can call on the name of the Lord and know that salvation is yours, that you can go through life secure and free, and that you can use your gifts without worrying about doing enough or being enough or accomplishing enough. You can rest and know that God loves you. And it's true if you're in the middle of your life and you're wondering if you've done enough or you're, you're wondering what lies ahead. It's true if you're at the end of your life and you're wondering if God still remembers you, if his salvation is, is still yours. So call on the name of the Lord today and tomorrow and every day until the last day. And on that day, everyone, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, including you, will be saved. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. Please rise for prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for bestowing the riches of your salvation, pardon, and life upon all who call on you. Whenever we doubt that salvation is ours, cause us not to dwell on our own works or performance, but on the works of Christ for us and on your trustworthiness and love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, we give you thanks for bringing us to believe that Jesus is risen from the dead and for enabling us to confess that he is Lord. For even now we cannot do these things apart from you. Prompt us also to make use of the triune name placed on us in our baptisms in every time of need, to call on, pray to, praise, and give thanks to God. Lord, in your mercy, Jesus, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Bring a peaceful end to the war in Ukraine. Bring calm to the violence that thrives in human hearts. Be with those suffering in war-torn regions. 
bring repentance, compassion, and wisdom to the world's leaders wherever they need it. Grant strength, faith, and boldness to the Evangelical Lutheran Church of Ukraine to minister to those in need in body and soul. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Almighty Creator, please give us abundant rain and snow in our region in the coming months. And through our need, teach us thankfulness and good stewardship. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord of the nations, you care for and came to win eternal life for all people without distinction. We pray that you would meet the needs of those who are ill through healing, if it be your will. We pray especially for Mike Shaw, Tori Yoakum, Sharon Parker, and Ted Lehman, the son of Jean and Lotar Lehman, and Dick McCormick. Hold close and comfort all who mourn with the certain promise of salvation, especially the family and friends of Eileen Hanovit. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray trusting in your mercy through your son jesus christ our lord amen, amen. the lord be with you and also with you lift up your hearts we lift them to the lord let us give thanks to the lord our god it is right to give him thanks and praise it is truly right and healthy for us to give thanks to you always holy father for the countless blessings you so freely give to us and reveal in all your creation. Above all, we give thanks for the love given to us without limit when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we applaud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of Sabbath, adored, heaven and earth with full acclaim, shout the glory of your name, sing Hosanna in the highest, sing Hosanna to the Lord. Truly blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of all creation, for you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. At your command, Abraham prepared to offer his son Isaac as a sacrifice on the mountain. Yet in mercy, you provided a ram as a substitute. We give you thanks that on Calvary, you spared not your only son, but sent him to offer his life as a ransom for many. As we eat and drink his body and blood, grant us, like Abraham our father, to trust in your promise now fulfilled in Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. Amen. Oh, 
Jesus Christ, true Lamb of God, you take the sin of the world away. O Jesus Christ, true Lamb of God, have mercy on us, Lord, we pray. O Jesus Christ, true Behold the Lamb who bears our sins away, slain for us. And we remember the promise made that all who come in faith by forgiveness at the cross. So we share in this bread of life, and we dream of his death. Thank you. 
After communion song is printed at the bottom of page 16, please stand. Gracious God, our Heavenly Father, you have given us a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your Son's body and blood. Keep us strong in believing, living, and sharing the true faith throughout our days on this earth, so that on the day when Jesus returns, we may join with all the saints and angels in celebrating the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. We praise you and acknowledge you, O God, to be the Lord, the Father everlasting, O the earth adored. To you, all angel powers, cry aloud, the heavens sing, the heart 
Everlasting, Amen. 